Welcome back to Introduction to Logic, Unit 2. In this supplementary video, we'll touch on some of the techniques used to translate ordinary language statements into proper categorical form. We've already learned a bit about how powerful Aristotle's system of deduction can be once we understand the logical relationships between the four categorical propositions. For example, if someone were to claim that all Democrats are liberal, but I happen to know a conservative Democrat, I know that their claim must be false, because I know contradictory propositions have opposite truth values. And it turns out Aristotle's system of deduction is even more powerful, as we'll find out in the next video. All of this goes a long way toward explaining why term logic was so dominant for such a long period of time in the history of Western philosophy. It was powerful. However, there is one major drawback. In order for us to make immediate inferences, or build categorical syllogisms, as we'll learn about next time, or sorites, we have to first get our statements into proper categorical form. The thing is, we don't naturally speak or even think in the language of categorical propositions. We speak and think in ordinary language. That means if we're going to use Aristotelian deduction, we're going to have to learn how to translate our ordinary statements about the world into the four proper forms. But that's also the good news. There are four, and only four, possible categorical forms. So once we get into the groove of translation, we're off to the races. Now, it's probably easiest to begin learning the skill of translating ordinary language statements into categorical form if we think of them as four different shapes corresponding to the quantity and quality of each statement. You can think of the universal affirmative as a rectangle, the universal negative, a diamond, the particular affirmative, a pentagon, and the particular negative you could think of as a star. Any shape and color will actually do. The point simply is to recognize that each one of them has a unique and distinct shape. Now take that and transfer it to the four propositional forms. All SRP has a different shape or form than no SRP. It looks different. Some SRP has a different form than some SR not P. Once you have this concept of shape firmly in your mind, all you're really doing is filling in the color of the shape with the subject and predicate terms. No matter what the subject or predicate is, the shape of the proposition is always going to remain the same. This is how to begin thinking about translating. No matter what ordinary language you start with, it will contain a subject and a predicate. All you need to do is figure out which of the four shapes match the intent of the statement that you're given. Now, as a process, we should always begin by identifying the terms of the ordinary language statement. That is, we want to identify what the subject and predicate are. Then, we want to supply missing nouns that are implicit in the ordinary language version of the terms. Third, translate all verbs into standard form copulas, R, which is all we're going to allow for categorical propositions anyway. So there can only be one main verb, one copula, connecting the subject and the predicate. It's always going to be R. You may also need to add some parameter words or phrases to help make the subject and predicate terms more clear and, in some cases, parallel. Spatial and temporal adverbs will almost always need to be translated to things like places that or times when in order to make the terms of the statements explicit. The same is going to be true for pronouns, which you can generally translate to things like people who or things that. For hypothetical or conditional propositions, these will be translated as universals. Now, in most cases, whatever is in the antecedent position, that is, whatever follows the word if, 
is going to be the subject term, and whatever's in the consequent position, that is, whatever follows the word then, is going to be the predicate. The exception is when the consequent term is negated, then it's reversed, and we use the universal negative as opposed to the universal affirmative form. Keep in mind that exclusive words or phrases are going to modify a predicate term, so be on the lookout for words like none, or only, or phrases like none, except. These are going to focus our attention on the predicate. Finally, the phrase the only is going to be a little bit different. The only is always going to be indicative of a subject term. So no matter where you find it in the ordinary language sentence, when you run across the only, you know what follows that is going to be the subject term of the categorical proposition when you translate it. Now look, this may seem like a lot to keep in mind, but you'll find with a little bit of practice that it will easily come to you, especially if you're a native speaker of the language, because you already have an intuitive understanding of the meaning of the language. Now, if you're translating in a second language from ordinary statements to categorical propositions, it may take a little bit more practice to get the hang of it, but you'll get it. Let's look at some examples to highlight the points that we've just made. Remember, you're always going to begin by first figuring out what is the subject and what is the predicate then work toward getting the rest of the form or the shape into its correct statement. Let's start with something really simple. Remember, step one, identify the subject. In this case, governments. Next, we can ask ourselves, what is a government? Well, I, I guess it's, a, it's an entity. It's a, it's a kind of thing. And we've already been given a standard quantifier and copula, so we're really well on our way. Some things that are governments are. Some things that are governments are what? Well, let's look to the predicate. Disorganized. Now, notice how there's no noun in this predicate. It's assumed that as a competent user of the language, you understand that adjectives modify nouns, so you don't really need to repeat the noun in ordinary language sentences. In fact, it would be redundant and cluttered. But in order to clarify exactly what the predicate term is, the category that is being related to the subject category, we need to ask, disorganized what? The answer of course, is it's a disorganized thing, since we've already established that a government is a kind of thing. So clearly, this is an I proposition. Some things that are governments are things that are disorganized. All we needed was a little bit of tweaking of the terms in order to make it fit into the proper form of some SRP, a particular affirmative proposition. Let's try another one. First things first, identify the subject. That is, protesters at the convention. Notice it's not just protesters. The whole thing is the subject term. Protesters at the convention is the subject term. Now, what is a protester? Well, since we don't have sentient robots, we know that protesters have to be people. And how many of these people are we talking about? Well, since we have the definite article, we know that we're talking about all of them. All people that protested at the convention were. Now let's look at the predicate. Again, notice that we're missing a noun here, so we'll need to supply it from what we've already articulated in the subject term. There were people who were arrested. So, we supply that, and we're almost done. We've got all people that protested at the convention were people who were arrested. But notice, we still have this non-standard verb to address. And that's very, very simple. We know there's only one copula that's acceptable in standard categorical propositions. So we change the word were to are, and now we have a standard form 
universal affirmative categorical proposition. All people that protested at the convention are people who were arrested. All S R P. Now what about this example? Our subject is unicorns, and we're predicating non-existence of unicorns. Now, a unicorn isn't a person, so it must be a kind of thing. So at first pass, we might get something that looked like this. Now, how many of these things are we talking about? It certainly looks like we're talking about all of them. The problem is, we don't have a categorical proposition in the form all S are not P. Something isn't quite right about this translation. To make this clear, let's look at a Venn diagram. If we want to indicate that whatever is in the set of unicorns is completely separate from the category of existing things, then we'd need to shade out region 2. Doing so makes clear that the intention here is not a universal affirmative at all. This statement is saying that no unicorns are things that exist. What we've got is a universal negative. It can often be helpful, if you're not quite clear on what's being stated, to doodle a little Venn diagram to help make it clear. Here's another example where a Venn diagram might be useful. As always, First, identify your subject and predicate terms, and add the necessary parameters. Next, notice that we have a non-standard quantifier. Since we only have universal and particular quantifiers, and since many does not mean all, this has to be particular. Also note that we have a non-standard copula, so we're going to need to use the term or the word R to connect some people who are logic students are people who failed their first exam. Even though the original statement told us that there are more than one who failed their logic exam, the logical implication is that there must be at least one such student that exists. So we have a particular affirmative claim, some s r p. Here's one for those of you who love riddles. Just because something is glittery doesn't mean it's gold. But how do we translate this into standard form? First, find your subject and your predicate. Now, we're not talking about people here, so we must be talking about things. We can also go ahead and take care of our non-standard verb by supplying the word are. Now the question is, how do we manage the quantity and the quality of this statement? Things that glitter are things that are gold. Is it all? Is it none? Neither of these two propositions, all S are not P, or not all S are P, are in the right form. They're not the right shape so we know we're not done yet. Let's look at a Venn diagram to see if it will help us. We have the category of glittery things, and we have the category of gold things. Of course, gold is glittery, but gold is not the subject here. It's the predicate. What this ordinary language statement is asserting is that there is at least one non-gold glittery thing. So the phrase not all is really the same as saying some. Therefore, we have some glittery things that are not gold things. Some things that glitter are not things that are gold. Some s are not p, particular negative. Let's wrap up our examples with a conditional statement. Now remember, Unless the consequent is negated, the antecedent is going to be the subject term, and the consequent will be the predicate term. The statement is telling us that there are no non-magical unicorns. So, in order to demonstrate that on our diagram, we would need to eliminate or shade out region 1. Now we can clearly see that all unicorns 
belong in the set of magical things. So this is a universal affirmative. All things that are unicorns are things that are magical. Of course, since unicorns and magical things don't exist at all, this is really a moot point from the Aristotelian point of view because, as you already know, we're not allowed to make categorical statements about non-existent things. However, as we practice translation, you can suspend your disbelief for a while and focus on the form that the categorical proposition must take. And this gives us another opportunity to emphasize why this sort of exercise falls under the heading of formal logic. In order to play the term logic game, we have to have statements that all fit into a limited set of shapes or forms. These set forms are what make Aristotelian and indeed any deduction possible. Learn the rules, follow the rules, and you will always get necessary results. We'll see this even more clearly in our next video as we learn to put two categorical propositions together according to a small set of rules and get necessary conclusions. So join us next time for an introduction to categorical syllogisms as we learn a little bit more about logic.